Turn with, turn with me this morning, please, to the passage that we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, and we're going to consider it's presented to us from verse 28 and through to the end of verse 44. And we know this as the, as it's a problem in your Bible, the heading is the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem in the last week of his, of his life on, on this earth. We read, when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Do you know what a motorcade is? A motorcade is basically a procession of, a, of vehicles, of cars and so on. And the term motorcade, it discovered, was coined by a gentleman called, called Lyle Abbott, probably about 1912 or 1913, and he was the automobile editor of a newspaper at that time called the Arizona Republican. And the motorcade, I think, that probably most readily comes to mind is that of the president of the USA, whichever president it happens, it happens to be. It's interesting to discover something of what comprises a motorcade of the president of the United States. It's made up of 20 to 30 vehicles. It carries spouses, children, and so on. You get members of the press. You've got security services, you've got White House officials, you've also got VIP guests in the motorcade. Seems that the major members of the motorcade that they travel eh, in armored vehicles, and these are typically specially configured eh, limousines that, that are made specifically eh, for the president and so on. The motorcade, it seems, contains of several armored vehicles. There's also a United States Secret Service electronic eh, countermeasure suburban unit. There's a kind of assault team, and then there's also vehicles that, that, that's filled with Secret Service agents. When it is that perhaps there's a possibility of hazardous materials, eh, perhaps on the route, then also you've got a, 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 a vehicle that precedes the President's vehicle, scanning for these hazardous materials. And then I'm sure we've all seen it, you've got the police presence at the front of the motorcade, and it's usually made up of motorcycle riders and so on. And it is that they're clearing the way for the arrival of the president and his motorcade into whatever world city it, 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 it may be. Now, it's interesting concerning the actual president's car itself, and I've managed to glean some information from the internet. And this information is just approximations because nobody really knows just what it is, how it is that the vehicle is made and so on. It seems that the president's car is worth at least a million dollars. It's 18 feet in length, it weighs eight tons, and it's got eight inch thick armor plating on, on its doors. I mean, that is, is some vehicle. And when it is that the president is, is in that vehicle, it's officially named Cadillac One, but the nickname for the president's vehicle at the front of the motorcade is the Beast. And certainly it is a beast in terms of how it's made, and that engine, it must, I think, drink up the gas. And you will see the gas gauge going down every foot that you're driving a, 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 along. But whenever it is that the president of the day enters a city, that's how it is that he enters the city. He's got this motorcade and it speaks of his authority, it speaks of his power, it speaks of the fact that there's somebody of great importance about he to enter that situation. And it seems that on March the 20th, 2013, that President Obama, uh, he was the last president uh, himself in his motorcade that entered the city of Jerusalem. Now, starting with that entry by Obama and his motorcade, the Holy Secret Service agents and everybody else, it's historic uh, 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 and uh, glorious in a sense as that was, it says nothing compared to the historic entry into the city of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago that we have here before us uh, in Luke's Gospel, uh, uh, chapter 19. Because 2,000 years ago, it wasn't the president, but it was the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who entered through the gates of Jerusalem. Now in this entrance, amongst the many things that the scriptures point to, it certainly is the case that we have the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and one prophecy in particular that was made by the Old Testament prophet Zechariah 500 years before it is that these events took place. If you go to Zechariah chapter 9 from verse 9, you read this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey and a colt, the fall of a donkey. It was something that the prophets prophesied of 500 years before these events actually happened. And just as a president, whoever it may be, as his entrance into a city reveals something of his power, his authority, his importance, and so on, likewise, Luke's a narrative of the entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem 
reveals to us certain aspects of the Lordship, of the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that basis it is that I think that Luke gives to us reasons why it's of absolute importance and necessity that all of us without exception here today, that we would ask ourselves, am I following Jesus Christ? Is it the case that Jesus Christ is my Saviour? And is it that I have known of his entry into my heart and my soul, even as the people of Jerusalem knew of his entry 2,000 years ago into their city? And for that reason, I want to consider at least five things this morning in the time that's left to us concerning the reasons why it is that we should and must follow Jesus and acknowledge this Jesus who entered into Jerusalem and ask if it is that he's entered into our hearts. First thing I think that Luke is saying to us is this, that because Jesus is the Lord of authority, we must follow him. Because Jesus is the Lord of authority, we must follow him. You see, what it is that we're reading here in Luke 19 inaugurates the week that led up to Jesus' arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. But in all these accounts, it conveys very clearly that Jesus was in absolute control of all the circumstances that were happening round about him at that time. In other words, the crowd's cheering, but Jesus isn't deluded by this cheering crowd. The Pharisees are there and they're questioning. But it's the case that Jesus is not intimidated by the threats of the Pharisees. But it's the case very clearly that in what's happening that Jesus is living according and under the precise timetable of his heavenly Father. And it was very much the case that Jesus knew that his hour was approaching. He knew that the cross was ahead in a week's time. And now in this Palm Sunday, as it's called, Jesus stages a very public demonstration to show the people, to show the rulers, that he's the Messiah, but he's not the kind of Messiah that they were hoping for or expecting. You see, the chief priests in the Sanhedrin, they're looking for Jesus, and they had already given a command that if anybody knew of the whereabouts of Jesus, they should inform them so that they might be able to arrest him. And here you have Jesus boldly and publicly performing an action that no doubt infuriates them, and it leads to his arrest and ultimately to his crucifixion, at the very moment that the Passover lambs were being sacrificed and slaughtered in Jerusalem, and this itself is the fulfillment of Jesus offering himself as the Lamb of God for sinners. So even the day of the triumphal entry, even something that we perhaps would think, well, you just mark it off in the calendar, and that's basically it. It's circumstances coming together. No, it itself was the fulfillment of God's prophetic timetable and something that God had decreed from before the beginning of time itself. And it's saying to us that Jesus Christ was in control of every event, every aspect, every moment in his life and his experience. And we see this, I think, in detail from verses 30 to 35. Look at what you read there. Jesus said, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you'll find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. That's pointing to the omniscience of Christ. He knows all things. He is the one who has made all things, and he knows all things happen in accordance with the Father's will. And then he says, if anyone asks, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord is in need of it, and so on, and so on. So Jesus' exact knowledge of the whereabout of the animals and the response of the owners of the animals to me indicate that Jesus Christ is completely aware of and is in complete control of his environment and his circumstances. In other words, nothing takes him uh, unawares. There's nothing that happens in the life of Jesus Christ where it is that he's moved to hold up his hands in horror and ask himself, why exactly is it that this is happening? Another thing I think that's worth noting is that you would have expected the owners of the animals, when they saw that their animals were being taken, to say something like, hey, what do you think you're doing? These aren't yours, these are ours. You haven't even come and asked us if you, if you can take them, but it is that you're just coming off the street and you're taking these animals away. But the thing that should strike us is this, that when the disciples replied in the terms that Jesus had told them to reply, the Lord is needed. It was then that the owner ceased to protest. And they allowed the two disciples to take the animals away with no statement being made at all about returning them. In fact, I wonder if they ever expected 
to see the animals again. Now, in order to understand, I think, more of what's going on here and the response of the owners, you've got to try and realise what it was that these two animals would, would, would mean to them. Wealth at that time in that part of the world was often measured in terms of cattle and livestock, how many animals and, and such that, that you had. And to put it in today's culture, the ass in its colt would probably have been, say, having something like a red Porsche convertible in your driveway, and beside it is the Ferrari. And it is that somebody's just coming off the street and saying, we want to take these and, 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 and use them. I mean, can you, can you imagine allowing two strangers, one to get into the Porsche, one to get into the Ferrari, to drive it off with only the words, the Lord's get need of it? You'd very quickly be locked up today, probably. So what is it about these words, the Lord has need of it, that satisfied the owners of these animals? Well, the key thing is to be found in the word Lord, which in every account of what happens here is the same term. What did the word Lord convey to the people of Jerusalem and to these people in particular? It referred to Jesus of Nazareth. Not only that, it's based on Old Testament roots, and it implies the deity of, of the one uh, who, who's uh, assigned this title and therefore his sovereignty over all creation. So when it is that the disciples said to these two uh, individuals, the Lord has, has needed it. It conveys to these animal owners that Jesus not only is the Messiah, but that Jesus is himself God and therefore is God and is the creator. Jesus has every right to possess these animals, whether he returns the animals or not. Not only the way in which the animals were obtained, but even the way in which it is that the Lord rode the animals into Jerusalem is a statement of his authority. And it's an authority that, that, that is exercised through his disciples, as Jesus sends them in his name. Now, what's the application for us here today? Well, I think it's this. Think on it. I'm saying that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm saying that Jesus is the divine Son of God. So therefore, why did Jesus lack anything? Why did Jesus need to borrow these animals? Why did Jesus not miraculous, miraculously create two an animals at that moment in that place? He could have done it. Well, I think there's a consistency with the fact of his first coming. Think on it. His parents, they had no place to bear the child other than a borrowed stable, cattle trough in Bethlehem. Jesus had no home of his own. He said the birds of the air, they've got nests, foxes of holes that they can live in. But me, the son of man, the creator, I've got nowhere to lay my head. Nothing. No doubt Jesus at night slept under the stars, the very stars that he created, the very stars that he knew, name by name by name. And he's there lying in the very dust of the ground from which he created the first man. And he's there as the Lord of hosts. And even he's buried in a borrowed tomb. Not even one that was a, 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 his, his own. So why did the creator of the heavens and the earth put himself in need so that he had to borrow what belonged to others. Well, let's remember in the first place, maybe it's the wrong thing to ask, because everything does belong to him. In the ultimate sense, the foal and its mother do not belong to men, but they belong to God. Men are only stewards of what it is that God gives to, it, to, gives to them. And it's the same for us today. So for the Son of God to borrow what belongs to others is really for him to possess what ultimately is his. And as the creator of, of, of heaven and earth and the creator of man, our Lord also possesses men. And that's saying to us that we are ultimately not free. God is free. And God is free to do whatever it is that he wants to do with what he created. So for the Son of God to lay claim to these two animals was consistent in terms of his right to, to lay claim to all creation, even to the point of including individuals, a, a men and women amongst that number. In other words, you and I here today are his possession, whether we acknowledge it or not, to do with what he pleases. 
So the question that you have to ask yourself today is this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ possesses all things? I mean, you may think you have your house and your car and whatever else it is. We live at a time when the kingdom of stuff rules. How much stuff you have determines who and what you are in this world. But Jesus ultimately owns it all. He has the right to lay claim to every fiber and aspect and nanoparticle of your life and to do with it as he pleases and to dictate how it is that these things are used at any time. What's your response? Are you bristling at that thought? Are you saying, not me? I'll do what I want with what I've earned in my way at my time. God says no. <laughs> See, it's one thing to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. But there's another thing to acknowledge Jesus as the possessor of all things. And all things meaning what you have from your bank balance to the clothes in your back today. And it's quite another to live this way in light of this knowledge. And he has chosen even to today to lay claim to the possessions of men. So what do we do when we go home? Do we thank him? Even at meal times, do we thank him for the very food that we put in our mouths that sustains us day by day? Do we thank him for the fact that when we go home today that our cupboards are full and not bare? Because he gives us the means and wherewithal to do this? Are we willing to release into his lordship, under his direction, our possessions into his hands? If we do that, it's a testimony to his lordship. You see, to have a faith, and a faith that perseveres, and a faith that grows, you need to understand that Jesus Christ alone is the sovereign Lord of authority. He and he alone, he is sovereign even over the evil things that are happening in the world today. He works all things together for his good, for his glory, and ultimately for the good of his people. In other words, it's saying Jesus wasn't just a well-meaning reformer because he made a mistake tragically in picking a disciple who ended up betraying him. But the scripture tells us that Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sheep of his own initiative. Listen to John 10, verse 17. This is Jesus talking. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The crucifixion, the most horrible crime imaginable. And those who did it responsible for this terrible sin. But not even that could thwart the sovereign will of the Father, but fulfilled it. Think of what the apostles prayed in Acts chapter 4, eh, and, and they're gathered together for prayer. And this is what they said. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Wow. What a perspective. What a thought, what an understanding. What a philosophy of life. And today you can either submit willingly now to Jesus and be blessed, but in the day of judgment that is coming, you will be forced to submit to him and you will be condemned forever. So this passage tells us that because Jesus is the Lord of authority, we must follow him. Are you following Jesus? Second thing the passage tells us is because Jesus is the Lord of creation, we must follow him. Not just the Lord of authority, but the Lord of creation. That Jesus is the Lord of creation is evident and the fact that he rode in an unbroken he called an unbroken donkey. I'm the horseman. Uh, I've only ridden the horse a few times, and I'll be honest, I was absolutely terrified. But I know that if you climb in an unbroken colt, don't expect to get a nice ride. Don't expect, I mean, my weight, what, 200 odd pounds, no wonder the colt would be unhappy trying to kick me off. 
But Jesus riding on the colt, and the colt accepting it and just going along with it, I think simply but profoundly shows his miraculous power over the creation that he himself spoke into existence by the word of his power. But there's also a spiritual significance in the fact that Jesus, eh, eh, the, the, the fact the colt was unbroken. You go to the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, when an animal was to be put aside for sacred use, put to sacred use, it had to be an animal that had never been used for a common purpose eh, at all. And there are two passages, Numbers chapter 9, verse 12, and Deuteronomy 21, verse 3. Listen to what they say, Numbers 9, and 8, verse 12. This is the statute of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect, on which there is no blemish, or on which a yoke has never come. Never been used for common use. Deuteronomy 21. And the elders of the city that is nearest to the slain man shall take a heifer that has never been worked, and, is, and that has not pulled a yoke. In other words, it's never been used for common use. It's, it's virginal in a, in a sense. It's prime. And is the fact that the animal had never been ridden a clue to the fact that it was, as it were, an offering to God and something to be used in service? And that is Jesus rode upon it. The fact that the animal in which Jesus rode had never been been written, I think, is a clue to his, to his deity and to who it is that Christ is. And the Lord's choosing to ride an animal that had never been written on, as far as I'm concerned, is a miraculous event. You can always see the owners of the cult when they're there. And they're sniggering to themselves and they've got that knowing smile on their face. Just wait till he tries to ride this animal. He's in for a shock. It's going to kick him off. And then it is, you can see the sort of snigger disappearing as they're watching him. And he rides off, and the animal is in full control of it. And the animal willingly and gladly is, is, is being driven by, by, by him. And this animal is now being used by the Messiah to ride into the city of David. Therefore, it had to be an animal that had never been ridden before by any individual. And what I'm saying is, that only the Lord of creation, the creator of this animal, could do that. So what's the application? It's simply this. If Jesus is the almighty creator, which I hope you believe he is, then certainly we should follow Jesus. The colt received Jesus on his back without bucking and braying and kicking. But the sad fact is, that Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not, and they cast him off. In other words, it's as though they kick him in the teeth and say to him, we want nothing to do with you. In fact, we're going to crucify you. And as with Balaam's donkey, Balaam's ass, this donkey is far smarter than the people of Jerusalem. Because it is that this donkey willingly and gladly bore the Messiah didn't kick or try to throw him off. How is it with you today? Do you at times in your life try to throw Jesus off? Do you try and kick him out of your life? Do you try and go your own way and say, I will not have this man rule over me. I will not trust him. I will not look to him. Once I did, but at this I'm going to kick him out of my life. See, that's how serious this is. That's how important this is. Because if it is that a donkey, a dumb animal, willingly and gladly took the Messiah on its back. How tragic that those created in the image of God, those who have minds, who have wills, those who, as it were, as you've no doubt heard me say so often, are princes, fallen princes, would then cast Jesus aside and say, we will have nothing to do with you. I'll go home today and look up a picture of a donkey. Learn from it. That you also made it Jesus, as it were, controlling your life and directing you and guiding you. You see, the whole design of the universe is that Jesus be praised. And that's what Jesus is saying uh, to, to, the, to, to, the, to the Pharisees. 
uh, uh, here. It is that, that, that you read that they themselves, the Pharisees, they were horrified at what they were hearing and what, and what, they were, what, what was being, be, being said. Look what happens. In verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, If these were silent, the very stones would cry out. In other words, the design of the whole universe, its vastness and its glory and its wonder, the ultimate design of the whole universe is that Jesus Christ be praised. Even inanimate objects like rocks, if it is that people won't do it, then Jesus will see that the very inanimate rocks do it. And that they will praise him and glorify him and honour him as their creator and their God. He will get what he means to get. And if it is that you refuse to praise Jesus today, then it is that the rocks will get the joy. And they're saying to us that we're here today not as the result of random chance, not as the result of that plus billions of years of evolution, but it's saying to us that the personal God has created us and this personal God is a purpose for your life and my life, both in time and in eternity. And that's why he's worthy of praise. That's why he's worthy of honour. That's why, as the Lord of creation, we must follow him. Third thing is, because Jesus is the Lord of prophecy, we must follow him. The Lord of authority is the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of prophecy. And therefore you must follow him. On, this, on the Sunday that Jesus entered Jerusalem, he fulfilled several Old, Old Testament prophecies. Some, and only a few that I can, get, can look at with, with you here. Psalm 118, we're going to sing it at the end of our service, verse, verse 22 to 27. It was a psalm that was sung by the pilgrims going to Jerusalem up to the feasts. It refers to Jesus. And remember, this was written about a thousand years before Jesus entered Jerusalem. The cornerstone, rejected by the Jewish leaders. And the day of the Messiah being referred to as the day that God has, has, has made. Zechariah 9, that we considered earlier on. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humbled and mounted on the donkey, even in the cold, the fall of a donkey. And this prophecy in particular reference to the Messiah in terms of his humiliation. The word that, that's translated as humble that Zechariah uses, it points to one who's not only humble, but one who's also oppressed and afflicted by evil men. It's interesting to note that after the time of Solomon, a donkey was considered a lowly animal. And it was written only by people with no rank and no position. It was, it was basically the, 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 the transportation of the peasants of the day. We would all be riding donkeys probably if we'd been alive at, 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 that, at that time. And the donkey was also considered a burden bearer. It was an animal of peace. It wasn't an animal of war. And by riding a donkey, Jesus is showing himself to the, the Messiah in fulfilment of Zechariah 9 and 9, not the exalted political Messiah of war as the people expected, but in his first coming, Jesus comes as the suffering Messiah offering peace and salvation. Now, of what application is that for us? Lydia is saying to us today that acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of prophecy enables us to persevere when we're wondering if history is running amok at this time. Think of what's happening throughout the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. The world has been turned upside down. The world, in many areas, is an absolute chaos. Let's bring it closer to home. Maybe for some of you, you're here today, and, 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 and you get that veneer of respectability, and everything seems well, and it's going well, but there's a war going on in here in your heart at the moment, or in your mind. And life isn't turning out the way that you expected life and your life to, to, to turn out. And the nations can rage. The psalmist speaks of this in Psalm 2. 
The kings of the earth could take counsel together. ISIS and, and, and Hezbollah, and whoever it may be, they can take counsel together and say that we're going to wipe Christianity from the face of the earth. And what do you read in the scripture? God laughs. He sits in his heaven and he laughs at them. Why? Because our God is sovereign over history. Our God is bringing things on each generation, each millennia, in accordance with his timetable and in accordance with his prophetic timetable. And what I'm saying to you today is this. If it's that in terms of the world, how much more then is it in terms of yourself here today? Think of the Jesus who said, not a sparrow falls to the ground, except in accordance with the will of my Father. Just this past week, uh, over the winter, we've been feeding the sparrows at a tree that's beside the deck. And I'll often spend time up in my study, and I'm there just watching them. I take great joy and delight in watching them, seeing them just hopping about. Sometimes the red cardinal comes, and the squirrels come, and they're all there, there together. But then this past week, I don't know what it was, there were a couple of days this past week, I'm sitting there looking out, in, in, from our living room. And there in the deck, there are three little sparrows. And they're bouncing about, they're coming closer and closer to the patio doors. And of course, the cats in our home, at that point, they're there, you could hear them. They're just salivating, looking through the glass, wanting to get the sparrows. But again, it made me think of what Jesus said the sparrows, seemingly worthless little birds. Not one of them falls to the ground except in accordance with the will of your Father in heaven. And the other one, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. For some of us, that's easier for them than being with other people to number the hairs of our head. But God is saying in beautiful picture forms, look, if that's the way it is for the birds and with your hair, think of how I know you steps that you're going to take and the turns, the crossroads that you come to in life. Why don't you ask me, Lord, which way should I turn? Should I go straight on? Should I go left? Should I go right? Should I stay where I am? That's how it is in a sense that we amongst all people on the face of this earth are a people who should are greatly blessed and should be daily rejoicing. The while it is we waking up each day and we don't know what the day holds for us, God knows. God has said, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you. I am with you always, even up to the end of the age. But do you believe that? Do you? Die? Do we live it out? It's easy to say, it sounds good from the pulpit. But what about in our day to day experience? I believe that you're always with me, Lord. I really do. And I believe that you've promised me that you will not leave me, you're not forsaken. I've got to be honest, Lord, I don't feel it. That is, I feel that you're nowhere to be found at the moment. But I'm not trusting in my feelings, Lord. I'm trusting in your word. And that's what we need to trust in. Fourthly, time's going. He's the Lord of authority. He's the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of prophecy. We've got to follow him. Fourthly, he's the Lord of judgment. Because of that, we've got, to follow, we've got to follow him. Look at verses 41 to 44. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. The, the word that's used there in verse 41, when you read he wept, the word wept, it's a stronger word than the word that's used in John 11 and 35 when you read that he weeps at the great side of his friend Lazarus. The word that's used here in, in Luke 41 is a word that means loud sobbing. It's a word that means a cry of agony. It's a word that speaks about someone, you know when you see them crying and you say, they're broken hearted. That's what it means here concerning Jesus. It's saying to us that he does not delight in judgment but mercy. He's not willing that any should perish but come to repentance. He's slow to anger and abounds in love to every sinner but he is also the righteous judge. One way to put it well, I thought, this is what he said, and I quote, Christ here proves his twofold nature, 
by shedding tears as man for what he foretold as God. Let me say it again. Christ here proves his twofold nature by shedding tears as man for what he foretold as God. See, God is not only a God of love and grace, but he's a righteous God and his wrath is settled against sin. His day of grace is not forever. That's what he's saying here. Jerusalem's day of grace was rapidly drawing to an end. And when it is that he speaks about what's going to happen in Jerusalem, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade, etc., around you. He's pointing to AD 70 when the armies of the Roman general Titus fulfilled this prediction. And when it is that Jerusalem is brought to its knees. It's a frightening prediction. And it came to pass. Go to the history books. You'll read about it. Well, that was the case then. What about the prediction concerning the soon coming Messiah? He came the first time riding on a humble donkey, proclaiming peace. But Revelation tells us that this Messiah will come again in power and glory, and he will be riding a white charger of war, and he will seek to tread the winepress of God's wrath. Listen to Revelation 19 from verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is the self-same Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. One day he's returning. And you seriously have to ask yourself, how are you responding to this King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Because in the day that he returns, as in Revelation as we're told, the day of grace is over. You see, you can miss the time of God's gracious visitation. And that's what Jesus was saying here. The time of your visitation has come. And maybe for some of us today, the time of the visitation of Christ has come. And maybe you will not be given a further opportunity. You see, if you refuse to come and bow before Christ, and before his rightful lordship, all that awaits you is that awful day of judgment on your sins. And that's what the scripture teaches. It's not me that's saying it, or because I've got a particular bent towards these things. I'm just proclaiming what the scripture proclaims. So why try to avoid him if he offers you a full pardon, if you will but trust in him? And that brings us to the fifth point with which we close. Because he's the Lord of salvation, we must follow him. The first time he came, he offered peace. And the offer stands until he comes again for judgment. He offers himself to us as the Passover or over Lamb. And he offers peace to you today in him and through the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins. The cross of Christ is offensive to many. They sneer at it, they laugh at it, they mock it even today. But we've got to lay aside any notion that we can save ourselves and that as we are, that God is pleased with us. See, there are two wrong notions that usually come together by people uh, that, that keep people out of heaven. First notion is this, that many today believe that God is too loving to send decent moral people to hell. Most people can accept the fact that God will judge a Hitler, will judge a Paul Pot, will judge ISIS, and, 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 and so on. But he'll judge really evil people. Most people would say, yeah, we agree, we agree with that. 
But if you, God, has been tolerant in terms of the normal sins that men and women commit every day, that law-abiding folks like us, us commit, you don't believe that God would, 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 would judge us for, for that. But the Bible makes it absolutely clear, God is holy. God is just. And no sin, no matter how big or small, is going to be tolerated. A single sin. Thought, word, or deed. No sin is to hell. But the second wrong notion that usually goes along with this one is that most of us, and perhaps th th this, is, this is the most subversive one of all, is that most of us are good enough to qualify for heaven. I mean, come on, I'm only human. I can't help it that I've inherited some of the traits of my mother or my father, a bad temper, a bad mouth, bad attitudes. I mean, we've all got our faults. Even you've got your faults, Alan. Tell me about it. Just ask my family. And after all, we're not really bad. I don't murder anybody. I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a child molester. I'm not like that. I'm actually quite a decent person. In fact, if, if you check up, you do a criminal check on me, there's nothing there. So we figure that the scales will tip our way when we stand before God because we're sincere. We meant well. Even though we're not perfect, come on, God. I really was a good person. And I know I should have gone to church. I know I should have read the Bible. I know I should have done all these things. But come on. Let me in anyway. But the scripture clearly teaches pretty good people don't qualify for God's heaven. Even the very best in human terms, the best pagan, will never get in. It requires perfect righteousness to get to heaven. And that's where Christ on the cross comes in. The one who gave his life a ransom for, for, for many. So someday, and I can guarantee this, someday you'll stand before God, as I will, you'll stand before your Creator, and you'll stand before Him either clothed in your own goodness, and that will be inadequate. Or you'll be clothed in the perfect righteousness of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So I want you to ask yourself as I close this morning, what, why should you follow Jesus? Some might say, well, I'm hoping that you can heal my broken life. I'm hoping you can heal my broken marriage. I'm hoping you can give me a happy home life. Well, I can assure you, you can do that, but that's not a good enough reason to follow Jesus. Others may say to me, well, I follow Jesus because I struggle with many emotional problems. And I hope that Jesus can give me an inner peace and an inner joy. Well, my friends, he can certainly give me an inner peace and an inner joy, but that alone is not an adequate reason to, to follow Jesus. Because following Jesus often gives you increased trials and persecutions. The main reason to follow Jesus Christ is because he alone is Lord. The main reason to follow Jesus Christ is because he is worthy of your praise, your glory, and, uh, 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 of glory and, and honor. He's the sovereign Lord of authority. He's the sovereign Lord of creation. He's the Lord of prophecy. He's the sovereign Lord of judgment. And he's the sovereign Lord of salvation. These five things, along with many others, are ample reasons to follow Jesus. I was thinking about what's going on in America at the moment. I'm sure all of us are transfixed and are going to be uh, more transfixed in the weeks and months to come, especially if Donald Trump becomes president. And I'm not making any political comments saying that, so don't take that from it, please. The Pope is not the place for politics. But my thought was, as I was thinking about the end of this sermon. If Donald Trump does become president, can you imagine what the motorcade is going to be like? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, at the moment, it's full of pomp and circumstance. So there you get the beast, that, what is it, 18-ton car. It must take a jet engine to drive that. But can you imagine if Donald, I, I think he'll end up with a, a, a sunroof. And he'll be up there and be waiting to everybody. Dear us, what is going to be like if Donald Trump becomes president? And 
as a presidential motorcade. The reason I'm saying this is because I want you, the next time whoever's president, the next time you see the presidential motorcade entering any city in the world, I want you to ask yourself, has the divine motorcade of God's grace entered into my heart? Have I known of his motorcade of grace entering into my life and transforming my life? If you do, what a glorious, glorious life can 